So we've got together to have a little bit of a chat about the latest barefoot science and where we currently sit with some of the benefits uh, of barefoot shoes, minimal issues, but also some of the problems with cushioning. So I thought we'd kick off by asking, um, you know, a question that, 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 that a lot of people probably are thinking, which is that the shoe industry continues to produce shoes with lots of cushioning. And how does cushioning actually impact the way that we move? And I thought we'd just go around everyone on this sort of broad question and maybe start off with Irene. Great, thanks. Um, I think cushioning affects the way that we move in a very big way. Um, what happens when someone has cushioning under their heel is it promotes a heel strike pattern, so landing on their heel. And when they do that, you tend to land with your foot way out in front of you, so tend to overstride. Um, and then that heel strike is associated with a very sharp rise to an impact peak. And that, that impact peak, that impact transient has been related to a number of running related injuries. So that's the first problem that I see with cushioning. Yeah, Chris, would you like to add to that at all? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a hugely important topic, cushioning in shoes, because intuitively people like it, but is it there for any good? Um, I'm, I'm, so I will explain about running where you where you switch from a heel strike to a forefoot strike, maybe to make your body do some of the cushioning rather than, than the shoe. I'm, I'm very interested in walking where that transition doesn't happen because forces are quite low compared to running anyway in walking. So when people walk on a cushion shoe, they still adjust their gait um, automatically without realizing, but it's it's to a more subtle, subtle way than happens in running. It's not, it's not a shift from a heel strike to a forefoot strike. It's sort of a, a softer heel strike, you could say. And we do that automatically without thinking. Um, if we have an uncushioned shoe, then we learn to cushion with our, with our feet because we have cushioning devices built into our feet and into our control system. Yeah, for sure. Peter, would you like to just add anything there at the end? Um, I think uh, that really covers the essence of it in terms of walking and running. Um, I think the thing that interests me is what follows on from those uh, biomechanics that Irene mentioned um, in terms of injury risk. Um, I think that's how I originally came to this. And I think we're starting to see some evidence that uh, certainly some of the most common running injuries are associated with these mechanics, which is um, what interests me. So I'd I'm like, hearing a lot one... there about, oh, please, Liz, yeah. Can I add one more thing? I think one of the other problems with cushioning is that the person ends up depending on it and relying on it. And like Chris mentioned, we have the ability to cushion ourselves. But when you put this cushioning in, people then, you know, they slam their heel into the ground. They don't feel like they have to cushion. And so when the cushioning starts to bottom out in a pair of shoes, people don't have the ability to cushion and then the impacts even get greater. And I think that's why when someone shoes after 200, 300 miles, they start to lose that cushioning. That's when they have injuries. But in the minimal shoe, which has no cushioning at all, the person has to rely on their own body to do the cushioning. So I think that's another problem with the cushioning. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah. I'm hearing a lot about running and this is certainly something that as a medical doctor, when I, when I talk to patients or when I talk to the public, you very much hear that there's an association between minimalist shoes and running. But I think, you know, I'd love to understand from you all as, um, you know, Chris touched on this in terms of walking, how maybe it's not going from a, a heel strike to forefoot or midfoot. It's just changing the way that we walk. Because what I've seen as a doctor is when I move patients over from uh, cushion shoes, and I recommend they, they have a trial in a minimalist shoe, they often say that things like their hip pain or their back pain or their knee pain or their general mobility is starting to improve as well. So this sort of goes beyond running as well, I feel. Um, you know, Irene, have you got any thoughts on that at all? 
I do. Um, I have a colleague, Bel Seco, in Brazil, who has done a study looking at using minimal shoes. And this was not any of the shoes that we have for running. It's a Maleca shoe. It's a Brazilian, very inexpensive shoe um, that is very flexible. And the women had NeoA. Two groups randomized. One used their normal shoes and one used the minimal shoes. And there was a significant reduction in the knee adduction moment. So that's the torque. And I talk about that in my, in my presentation. It increases the torque at the knee. So significant reduction in that knee torque, significant reduction in pain medication, significant improvement in the Womack over six weeks. And there was no other exercise given. It was only minimal shoes. So here's an application of minimal shoes in, a, in an older pathologic population. Yeah, I mean, with the older population as well, what I've seen is balance improving when you're not in a, a thick cushioned shoe, which which seems quite intuitive, really, actually, if you think about it. If you, if you wanna have more balance and awareness, why would you go on a thickly cushion shoe? You'd want to be as close to the ground as possible. Um, Chris or Pisa, could any of you speak to that at all as to how this might impact gait and, and, and in particular balance in an elderly population? Mm -hmm. Sh shall I go first? So, um, yeah, Chris, why not? You go first. So, so obviously balance is really important in, in, in older people, in, in anyone, but in older people, if they do fall, it often leads to really big issues, including uh, hip fractures, which are um, catastrophic. Um, and it's totally right. So cushioned shoes, even though they intuitively feel comfortable, they don't stimulate balance. I think there are at least two reasons for it. The first one is purely mechanical, because if you're walking on a cushion, it's, it's going to be less stable. You have a little firm support under your feet in a way. It's like sitting on one of these fitness balls rather than on a kitchen chair. Um, it, it makes you wobble more just because it's mechanically, it, ha it has more give, it's compliant. And I think the second reason why uh, cushion shoes, um, to some extent, impedes the ability is because they blunt the sensors we have in our feet. So our foot sole is very sensitive. I'm sure we've all enjoyed foot massages. Uh, we have very sensitive foot soles. We use that information to inform us about what's happening under our feet. Um, and if you walk on a cushioned sole, we have less information to work with. Now, if you're an older person, all your sensations are slowly declining. I mean, we all, I, I started to wear glasses a few years ago. Uh, our sense of balance is reduced and the reception or, sort of, of the mechanics under our foot sole, they also get reduced. So I think, especially in older people, we need to make sure they have all the information they can get to inform their balance system. So I think those are the two main reasons why cushioning um, is not, in most cases, not a good idea for older people if you want to prevent falls. Yeah, thank you. And Peter, I wonder if we could just speak uh, again on the idea of walking as opposed to running, and um, particularly some of those additional benefits in terms of injuries when people transition from cushion shoes to minimal shoes. Yeah, you know, as you're asking the question about um, encapsulating walking as well as running into into our conversation today, I sort of zoomed out for a minute and I thought about it and I said, well, if, if you if you come in with a cushioned shoe, we have the acute effects that Chris and Irene have spoke to in terms of blunting the sensory information, um, using more blunt uh, mechanics in both walking and running. That's, that's the acute effect, but there's also longer term effects. So muscles um, work according to the kind of principle of use them or lose them. So this is kind of a secondary aspect to this, which is that, um, you know, we, we are designed to adapt to stress. And if we remove the stress, then there's no reason for our muscles to remain um, strong and to service in the way they normally would. A way people might be able to think about this is, um, you know, if, if, if you go to the gym and you train a muscle, it, it gets bigger and stronger. But equally, if you sit at home and don't do that, um, it shrinks. So when we place our foot in this cushioned environment, it's a bit like placing ourselves on the sofa rather than in the in the gym. So now what we have is a sort of a double hit because 
we have these mechanics that we've been talking about, but they're now being inflicted on a structure that's not able to to cope in quite the same way that it was before. There's one other thing with cushioning and the heel is that, you know, particularly if you think about most people's day job in the Western world where they might have a, a dress shoe, both in men and women, they'll have some sort of a heel. So again, you're holding your, your, your calf muscle and your Achilles tendon in a shortened position. You're removing the stress from the foot. So you're going to weaken the foot muscles. So you have those mechanics plus the, um, the deconditioning that happens from the long-term use of those. So then we have a sort of a perfect storm in how we get to this um, injury mechanics. Like all injuries are multifactorial, of course, but you know, generally when we go through rapid changes in loading, we're, we're certainly more likely to experience an injury. So let's think about that now. If we have our acute mechanics, um, maybe somebody takes up running um, at short notice, um, ups their mileage, using these mechanics on structures that are not quite as conditioned as they were maybe during our hunter-gatherer days, then th that's a real recipe, isn't it, for, for, for creating a problem? Yeah, so, so interesting. And, you know, it makes such intuitive sense to people. It's, it's, it's incredible that we have to almost make the case for something that was the norm for for so, so long. It's incredible how quickly the norms in society change. We're talking a lot about transitioning. So, you know, people are used to, let's say, cushion shoes, and, you know, then we need to move them back into minimal shoes, and there may be some benefits. But what if we never transitioned? What, what if we never had to think about transitioning? What if we all started, uh, let's say, with children, never going into cushion shoes in the first place? And Obviously, as a, as a father of two children, I'm very passionate about this. My kids have always worn barefoot shoes since they were kids. Uh, I, I don't see any reason to put them in cushion shoes and actually have to undo all those changes later on in life. But I, I wonder if we could really focus in on children's health. And, you know, if we start again with you, Irene, what is the importance, would you say, of children uh, either being barefoot or when they have to wear shoes, which of course they have to in various situations. What are the benefits there of uh, minimal shoes for children? So I think that this is the answer. I think this is the holy grail, actually. Uh, if we start kids in minimal shoes, then you don't have to adapt. They develop stronger feet. And there was a study back in the 60s um, by Rao who looked at Indian children and looked at three communities, one that were barefoot, one that wore closed-toed shoes, and one that wore open-toed sandals. And what they found is that the children that came from the barefoot communities had less incidence of pes planus. And the people that came that were in the closed-toed shoes had the highest uh, incidence of pes planus. And it's, it's completely um, counterintuitive. I think we all think if you don't put something underneath it, your arches are going to fall. But I think it's really important that we start our kids in these minimal shoes. And then we, at the big, I think the biggest hurdle to minimal shoes today, in, especially in running, but is this whole question of injury. And the injury, in my opinion, really is related to transitioning. And if we can take that out of the equation and get people back, you're absolutely right. We've been running and been barefoot for 2 million years. And we've only been in cushioning about 50. So if you do 50 over 2 million, I mean, that's a really, really, really small percentage of our, our, our being. Yeah. I mean, just to speak to what you said there, I mean, I remember as a, as a kid, you know, every other summer we would go to Calcutta in India, which is where my parents are from, and we'd stay there for six weeks, and I'd want to play with my cousins. I remember we would play, and my uh, when I was about eight, he said, come on, come on, let's go and play football. And I'd go downstairs with him, and everyone's playing barefoot, and I'm used to wearing shoes all the time. But by the end of the summer, you know, I was very used to playing football and tackling barefoot, and you, your feet felt stronger. And these guys were never getting injured or anything, but they were just playing barefoot the entire time, which sort of speaks to that study that you were speaking about. Chris, you know, any thoughts there on, on children and how beneficial this could be if we could get it ingrained in society that we're not going to put kids in cushion shoes in the first place? Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with what, what, what you said and with I, what Irene said. I think it's... it's there's a holy grail to just 
not getting into bad habits of shoes that are either too cushioning or also too constricting because a lot of shoes are too narrow as well, which will also change the shape of our feet. The thing is, as a biologist, my starting point is um, we've been quite okay for about 7 million years without shoes. So the idea that some people have that you need to squeeze children's feet into, like when I was young, I, I were almost like tiny mountaineering boots because children's feet are so weak, we need to support them. We haven't done it for 7 million years, so the idea that we need to do that is quite odd. Um, and I think children's, well, if, if we make sure that children walk barefoot a lot, I agree they get stronger feet. And we know that muscles are there to support the arch. So if you think about it, it makes sense that if you have stronger feet, you have a good arch as well. In addition, children's feet are not bone yet. It, they're still ossifying. So it, it's still cartilage up to the age of, I think, around seven or so. So anything that happens to a children's foot will have a big impact on the shape of the foot. Whereas in adults, I started wearing barefoot shoes like every day, maybe 10 years ago, but my feet are all ossified. They're not going to change dramatically. But children's feet are so uh, plastic that we need to be extra careful what we do to them. Yeah, it's so, so important. It's crazy how, how we seem to have got to where we have got to. Uh, Peter, I wonder if we could just, maybe on the, on, the, on the theme of children, if there's parents who are under the impression and have been told for many years that it's important that we cushion your children's feet, it's gonna protect them, it's gonna give them support, these are the words that, that, that get used in, in marketing, they get used uh, just when parents who, who want to do the right thing for their kids, they always say, no, I want their, that, want their feet supported. How, Peter, would you suggest that we start having that conversation with parents and, and suggest that actually what they've been told may not be the best thing for their children? Okay, well, that's the, um, that's the societal question. Um, and up to a few years ago, I would have uh, once said, oh, forget about that question altogether. Um, but I had a, a corrective experience when I was in New Zealand. Um, I was on a six month research sabbatical there and I began to notice that um, it was culturally acceptable to be in places like um, in the UK would be like a, a Tesco or maybe in the, in, the, in the US, it would be like a Walmart. It was OK to be barefoot in these places. And so one day I was looking out my office window and I saw a, a, a boys athletics, schools athletics uh, event on. And the boys were on the tartan track, but 50% of them weren't wearing any shoes. And I sort of went back to work for a minute and then I said, I looked out again and next minute it was the 800 meters and then the 1500 meters. And it was still, you know, up to a third of boys with, with no shoes on. And up to that point, I had been a keen barefoot runner myself but I'd always taken care to use a, a golf course or a, or a beach or something like this and here I saw these boys who had no inhibitions whatsoever about running I mean quick I've got some really cool photographs of, of boys running really really fast um, on a hard you know those those tartan tracks are not soft um, so then then that really gave me a corrective experience because even research papers they sort of um, they sort of take a Western country as a shod uh, child and adolescent control, and they compare it to um, a third world country as a as a barefoot control. And obviously, it works really well from a from a footwear perspective to do that. But it leads us to assumptions that maybe economics um, is, is the main reason what why the differences are there. So here I was in New Zealand. This school was in a very affluent area. I actually um, checked the data on it. It was. I think they ranked their areas from one to ten, and this was second um, in in Auckland, which is um, quite a quite quite a big city. And um, it just culturally wasn't the thing to 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 wear shoes there. So um, what I really took from that, of course, I had to do a study on it because my brain almost exploded as I as I watched it happening in front of me. But what I what I what I had to what I really took from it was, okay, they can do it. Uh, you know, th this is possible. Th they can be in a Western environment and they can do it. Um, and I thought even if that study just shows people 
this is this is possible when they are left alone and not uh, interfered with uh, with with what you describe as kind of this um, uh, obsessive uh, desire to, to 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 do the right thing or or or, or whatever. Um, these boys were just fine, you know. So um, if if the Kiwis can do it, I don't see any reason why we can't do it. Yeah, so interesting to hear how 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 the environment, how the societal norm influences uh, behaviour, and obviously this goes beyond footwear. This goes to all kinds of things in life. How powerful the environment is uh, at influencing that. When we talk about kids, we're talking about cushioning, uh, but there's also, isn't there, the component that a lot of these shoes are pointed at the front. They're sort of restricting um, how the feet sit within the shoe. Um, Irene, is that something that we need to look at as well in terms of uh, the, the footwear we're putting our children into? Absolutely. Um, Chris kind of touched upon this, that they're, they're very plastic at that point. And if you are forcing the feet into a narrow shoe, the bones are going to have to adapt to that. So it's really not a very good thing to do. And, and I think um, it's really important that you let the foot spread. Uh, in my presentation, I show a video of a, a barefoot as it's loading, and you can see that the the metatarsals, they, the the toes, they spread. There's a natural spread, and you need to allow that that spread. I, I wanted to make one other comment about the cushioning. Um, I think that one of the things that people always ask me about cushioning, and this can relate to kids too and injuries, is well, you wouldn't really want them running in minimal shoes on hard surfaces, and I think what people don't appreciate is that we have this amazing leg spring that can adapt its stiffness to the surface that it comes in contact with. So when we land on hard surfaces, we make our leg more compliant. And we land on soft surfaces, we make our leg more stiff. And now granted, you wouldn't want to train on a soft surface so that you're constantly having more of a stiff leg and then go run a race on a hard surface. You need to train your leg to be able to to endure, you know, the distance on hard surfaces or soft surfaces. But I think it's a it's a feature that we have innate in us so that we could run on hard packed savanna back in the day or on soft prairies or, you know, we can run on a lot of varieties of surfaces. And I think that people really get concerned about that. And I think it, it, even with kids, they think that it's because it's because they're running on hard surfaces that they're getting injured. It's not that it's because they're not being trained to run on hard surfaces and cushion themselves, treat, train their body to do that cushioning. So it's a lot of education with, with parents and, and with, with uh, physicians. It's, it's changing, it's, it's a big paradigm shift for people to think about that. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me as though we've got to, um, there, there's several components to this. There's obviously the, 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 the sort of gold standard solution is the younger generation, we can get this instilled and people understand so they're not having to correct later on. But then we've got the existing adult population. I don't know the percentage of people who are currently injured uh, with some niggle of some sort, but it's certainly a significant percentage. And, you know, I do wonder, as a medical doctor, how many of those might be helped, uh, improved or completely, um, you know, their, their symptoms eliminated by actually uh, better gait and more sort of natural gait and, and, you know, with minimal issues helping them. Chris, sort of, as we sort of draw this conversation towards a close, um, you know, for people who are watching this and, and are feeling quite inspired, perhaps, to make this transition if they're an adult or actually, you know, keep their children in that sort of barefoot model in minimal issues, you know, have you got any advice for them? Um, so, sort of how would you... How would you ask them to think about this and actually progress into this transition? So you're talking about children or about the adults? I guess both really. Either, either A bit of advice for both, please. So I think for children, the answer is quite easy. It's best to avoid the transition. Just keep them in barefoot habits. And if they have to wear shoes, obviously, which they will have to, even just to not get cold feet, then make sure the shoes are, are respectful for the human body, so wide enough, no cushioning or minimal cushioning, minimal shoes. For people who do transition, which would be adult people like, like you and me, I would say when it's walking is fairly easy, 
um, in the sense that people will initially feel sometimes a bit uncomfortable because they're used to sitting in a sofa, as Peter said. And if you if you then suddenly sit on a on a harder chair, it feels a bit uncomfortable. In the long run, it's not so easy, uh, not so difficult to get adjusted to minimal shoes in walking. I often compare it to a bike where if you get like your grandma's bike with a gel saddle, it, it's really soft if you go sit on the saddle, but if you try to cycle 20, 30 K with it, it doesn't work. What works much better if you have a really beautiful, very hard, but well-shaped race saddle, that's how you can cycle 100, 200, 300 K. I think it's a bit the same with minimal shoes. It, they feel a little bit less comfortable in the beginning, but actually I think it's a better recipe. Now, if you, if you talk about transitioning to minimal in running, uh, but Irene and, and, and Peter are a better place than me to say something about, but then it is important to do it gradually. Um, because obviously in running, all the forces are much, much higher than in walking. Forces are typically three times body weight in, in running and they aren't in walking. So transitioning to walking, I would say just, just give it a go. Use common sense um, and well, know that there is science supporting it. It, it, it. it is shown that you will get stronger foot muscles, for example, and it is shown that it will improve balance and that will become really important later in life. Yeah, thank you for that. Really, really helpful. Uh, and Peter, perhaps you could speak to those people who want to transition. They're runners, they enjoy running, they're used to running in cushion shoes and maybe they're feeling a little bit, um, you know, a little bit nervous about well, why should I change and how can I change? Perhaps you could give some words of advice there, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll maybe half wear my runner hat and half wear my science hat on this. And um, I think, uh, as Chris said, it needs to be gradual. I think there's a couple of considerations that they need to, to think about. Um, one is um, pace. So if they're keen runners and they like running, they will want to train at a certain intensity or a certain pace. Now, when we transition to minimalist, particularly on a hard surface, we have to slow down, of course, because we have much better information to our body as to what's happening under our feet. So um, in that case, um, someone might want to use a slightly more pliable surface, like a, like a grass or a sand-based surface, medium firm. And, and the reason I say that is, is to maintain that training um, intensity. I, I would start people off with as little as 10 to 15 minutes in warm ups and cool downs or, or something like that. The other issue is, is that the harder the surface we transition onto, we we tend to um, have to plant or flex or so point our foot towards the ground, even even a bit more than normal. And initially, that that can be quite stressful for the calf and Achilles, which is a good thing in terms of we're switching to, to using our muscles and tendons. But again, if, if we haven't been using them, um, there's some nice little studies coming out now showing that a slightly more pliable surface can make it a little bit easier for those muscles and tendons to to get to grips with, with the barefoot running. I agree with Irene that, you know, variable surfaces um, of different uh, firmness overall to train us and condition us. But I'm just thinking about those keen runners that you talk about there who, who might want to get started straight away. And I think a slightly more supple surface and, and, and not too long a period in the beginning, maybe a warm up, a cool down would be a good way to get started. And if you get started that way, um, you won't go back. I didn't. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Great tip. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. Irene, I wonder, would you like to leave with any closing thoughts, anything that we haven't picked up on yet around, you know, transitioning or advice to people. I think that would be super helpful. Yeah. So I think that there's an interaction between foot strike and footwear in running. Um, in walking, you still are a heel striker. You, walking is meant to be heel strike. But if you're going to transition to a four foot, stri a four foot strike pattern, you really should do it in minimal shoes because our research has shown that because of the heel to toe drop and because of the lateral flares of cushioned shoes, people tend to plantar flex and invert more it, it increased um, when they do that in a pair of conventional shoes. And that results in a greater impact in the anterior posterior direction and in the medial lateral direction. 
So you have these increased load rates now in the other directions as well. Uh, if you're going to remain a heel striker, and some people want to do that, I'm fine with that. Just make sure you put cushioning under the under, under your heel. So don't don't be heel striking in a pair of minimal shoes because you need that cushioning. But if you're going to go to a forefoot strike, we've had people who've done it and they end up getting problems like Achilles tendonitis and and um, posterior and uh, um, perineal tendonitis, lateral ankle problems. So, yeah. Brilliant. Look, super helpful discussion. I think there's just so much there from, uh, you know, your, your, all, all of your experience, but also the research. And, you know, we, we touched on all kinds of things today. We touched on heel striking when running and how it's very difficult to do that in minimal issues, if not close to impossible, I would say, certainly when, when I've tried. Um, but the, the sort of improvement in pain, the improvement in gait, the improvement in all kinds of different injuries, we touched on, you know, the less torque in the knee when we're wearing these minimalist shoes. Uh, and of course, the gold standard, how wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get all the children around the world barefoot and in minimalist shoes to prevent this transitioning in the future. Really enjoyed chatting to all of you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. And uh, I look forward to the next time we manage to get together.